Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to Shop Talk. Joined by my host, Glenn, tonight. How are you doing, Glenn? I am swell, Dave. Good to hear. So one of the questions I saw in the comments this week when I was doing my usual perusal of the comments was about the hardest or weirdest bug that I've ever had to fix. And it's probably not the hardest bug, but it took me the longest time to fix and was the most frustrating was a bug when I was working on an old game for the Commodore 64 in like 1988 called Tour de Force. And I was living and working out at Ottawa there. And I was working on this game and it had multiple loadable levels. So you would race in different countries and the graphics and the code would get reloaded off disk for that level. And long story short, whenever it went to load in graphics, it would work and it would be fine. But then the program would crash inevitably, like within the next 30 seconds. And long story short, what it turned out to be after several days was the loadable module misspecified the length of the graphics that it was loading by 16 bytes or something. And what that caused was since this was loaded up at the top of memory, it actually wrapped around memory, came back up around to address zero. And one of those in very low in memory happened to be the pointer of where I was storing the graphics data. So it would go up and overwrite its own pointer, then trash random memory, depending on what the graphics data was, and then later crash. And so with no debugging tools other than like putting in printf to change the border color at opportune times, it was a debugging nightmare and uh, took me several days to solve. So. Yeah, speaking of learning experiences, I finally got a hard drive to format in my PDP-1173 today. Holy cow. Is this where we throw the confetti up in the air and shoot off some fireworks? We would. If this was on the Apple, I would just hold up two thumbs and I could get fireworks. <laughs> but So I get the machine up and running, and now I've got a bare drive, that I and I've booted off an alternate virtual drive. And I did this, and it would go all the way through the format, about three or four minutes, finish the format, and then fail writing the FCT. And I don't know what FCT is. File control table, function something table. I have no idea. I don't know if you remember the olden days, but, uh, and I saw this a question in the comments too, but this label on the drive, which you probably can't read, but it's printed up and it has all the bad, bad block information on it. This one actually has no bad blocks from the factory, so it's an uninteresting table. I could have picked one that was a little more defective for you, but, uh, and eventually, I got it all working. So I'm feeling pretty manly having formatted an old MFM hard drive today. But it's nice. That I've got the floppy drives working in it. I've got formatted floppy drives. I'm, I don't know if I mentioned, but on the PDP-11, you cannot format a floppy. It actually, it's got the format program even says unformatable when it looks at the those two drives. And the reason is DEC only sold pre-formatted floppies. So you had to buy them brand new from DEC. You weren't allowed to format your own. So How many floppies you got kicking around in your shop? Uh, I've only made two or three. <laughs> so what I did is I got an image of some other PDP-11 right. floppy. I forget what was on it. But then I got that image going, formatted it in the uh, <clears throat> grease weasel, that drive <laughs> emulator. <laughs> right. And then deleted all the files from it and then re-imaged it as an empty disk. And okay. I've been using that to basically format or create formatted floppies. Nice. Camera shy is saying, I'm confused. The channel is Dave's Garage. But he says, welcome to my shop. So which is it, garage or shop? There is a difference. There is indeed. Here's how I look at it. My garage is a fairly big place. It holds a number of cars. Plus, it has a shop area, which has cupboards and counters and workbenches and tools. So there's the shop, which is within the garage. So it's Dave's garage, and I film it in the shop section. So it's welcome to my shop. Uh, I know that also confuses some Europeans because I think shop only has the purchase, the shopping connotation over there. I don't know if they they could they must say workshop because my Mercedes says visit workshop. So relative to we know then the uh, shop is in the garage, and where's your attic? <laughs> <laughs> right above us. <laughs> yeah, I've been up there a couple times. I went up there once to uh, run cables. And, uh, oh, for my solar panels. So I had to go in and I had to connect the solar panels, the cables that I had fished down through the roof. And I went up and it was a pretty hot day. You know, it was like 90 degrees out and sunny. Well, up in the attic, it had to be like 130 or something. It was just crazy. And I'm crawling along on my belly because it's a tr truss system. And it's super hot. And I'm just, finally, I burst out sweating. And now I can't even shed heat. And I'm crawling through fiberglass. And I got a mask on, so you're rebreathing your own heat. I get down to the end, I plug in the cables, and I thought, I'm not going to make it. They're just going to find me here. <laughs> I'm going to pass out. I'm going to die. But no, I did eventually get back out. So, Catherine Zeta Drones. The swirl lamp Good mode one. in this video is on point. Uh, where can I buy the light, and is the sequence in this video standard? It's a lamp I bought at Home Depot, which was just a standard white light. 
Then I stripped the LED strips out of it. I stripped the electronics such as they were and the power system out. And then I put in my own LED strips and an ESP32 module and the night driver LED code. And so it does flame effects. It does music, audio, reactive stuff. Um, you said that RLL allowed hard drives to store up to 50% more. How did they deal with the uncertainty of the type of data when advertising the size of the drive? Uh, I think I know what he means. So in the conversion going from MFM to RLL, it's a more efficient, more efficient encoding. Right. But it is deterministic. It's not like more or less compressible data comes out to shorter bits, but bit patterns. It's still a fully deterministic one. So you know that storing one million bits of data is going to take this many bits right. of flux. And it's just more efficient than MFM was. So there's no compression going on. Doesn't matter what the original source data is. Okay. Uh, hello, Kitty Fan Man. Um, what are the official names for 34 pin floppy and the dual ribbon type for the MFM era hard disk drives? The most common name you'll hear thrown about is ST506. And I believe that was like the first hard drive that used that format. So it kind of just got associated with the name ST506. But the actual name for the interface was the SA1000 when it was SA for Shugart Associates. Marge Genevera. How about deck tape? How was it encoded? It could read both while moving either forward or backward. Yeah, it actually used Manchester encoding. And Manchester okay. encoding is the one you're, where you remember, if you remember, whenever a bit is encoded, there's a transition in the flux. Right. And a zero is encoded as, you know, down to up. And a one is encoded as up to down. I might have that backwards, but that's the general right. idea. Yeah. So the beauty of that is once you've passed that flux transition, you can back the tape up and go the other direction, and it doesn't matter because you're just reading the changes from up to down and down to up. And then, uh, so, Sebastian Bastian, I'm a little bit confused. Also, when did they start using bytes? I believe the concept of a byte, the 8-bit byte, originally came out with the IBM 360. And if that wasn't the very first use of it, it was really the first popularized use of it. But bytes didn't really become a important entity, I wouldn't say, until the PDP era. So the PDP 11, it's a 16-bit word, but you can move and operate on individual bytes on individual byte addresses. Yeah, I seem to remember Dave Cutler talking about that. Something. Yeah, well, the PDP uses 18 or 22-bit addresses, okay. but the data go. is always still 16. So. Yeah. Yeah, Ickety 99. What's hard to understand from video is how these algorithms are even compatible with each other when you were swapping between new generation drives to old. Um, would people with older floppy see corrupted data? Yeah, you can't go back and forth. You have to reformat the entire disk with that encoding scheme, and the controller has to know how to read and write that scheme. Even going from an MFM to an RLL controller, we talked about that in that episode, you're not going to be able to read what was on the drive before. You're going to have to completely format it as if it's just nonsense garbage on there and start fresh. Uh, Boston Rocks, how does defrag fit in all of this? The uh, whole point of defrag is to keep a file contiguous on a disk so that when you're reading a file in, you have to step the head a minimum of times. So you pack all the data on the disk close to one another so that it doesn't have to go read a block here, jump halfway across the disk, read a block there, come back a third of the way. And, you know, worst case, if you had to step for every block of disk, you'd be thousands of times slower than if you could just read it in one track at a time. Randall Kafis, uh, and what encoding would we find in Server Farm HDD today? Oh, what do they use today? Uh, most of it is TDMR, but what <laughs> TDMR? I always think of it as too much data magnetic recording, but I think it's two dimensional <laughs> magnetic recording. Okay. And I think they use like multiple heads. Okay. And so they're kind of striping down at the flux level. And so they can read really small changes. Um, and then there's a EPRML or EPML, which is a newer version of RLL, which is a little more complicated than RLL but is highly air tolerant and efficient at encoding. There's a uh, format where the drive gets shingled. When it writes one, this is a really horrible explanation, but imagine it's shingled like a shingle roof. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and some so overlap you, sort of then, is it? Or Yeah, so if you want to replace the middle shingle, you have to rewrite all the shingles down the roof to that point because you can't just go and redo, do one in the middle. And it's something like that. And you don't want that for like a NAS drive. It's probably okay for a data drive or something like that. But uh, M. Scott Howell. Remember when the bad sector map was labeled on the hard drive? <laughs> it actually gets back to what you're, yeah. Unless you had no sectors, of course, then the label was blank, but. 
That's what I was showing you. That's why you couldn't read it because there was nothing on it. Because <laughs> when I was on DOS, it was double space. And at that point, the lawsuit was going on, which was Stacker or the company had a patent on the use of a hash table in compression. It's kind of silly because it's no one, there's no other obvious way to do. So Microsoft had to come up with a way to do it without a hash table and they rewrote double space and called it drive space. But uh, I'm gonna have to look into that because 622 was the point release done after I worked on 62 and I left and then wound up in NT. So, oh, okay. And so when you, what version of DOS were you working on when you first got to Microsoft then? 6.2. Oh, it was. Okay. And that's, well, I think, yeah. yeah, I agree. But the first rule of YouTube, I think is people will forgive terrible video, even bad editing, but they will not forgive bad audio. So yeah. uh, A.H. Seaton says, you mean you weren't an AI all along? I could be one now. We'll never tell. I'd be more symmetrical if I were an AI. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's perfectly symmetrical <laughs> face. <laughs> yep. We, uh, we tested that the other night. Who is the marketing idiot that thought that Windows Recall would be anything but a horrible name for a horrible concept? Wow. Yeah, not a lot That's of love for Recall. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't mind it if there was like, if my Mac did it and I could turn it off and on with a little slider in the top tray, I think that would be cool. Like I'm going to do some work and I want to be able to come back and record it. So I'll turn that on, let it do its thing, and then I'll turn it off when I'm done. I don't want it on all the time. But these are the same people that probably click OK when the web browser asks if they can use their webcam. And now it's recording you anytime it wants. So is that even any worse than recording your desktop? I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. Roger P5816, why does user access control, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device, some program installer, yes, no? Why do those things all need to be system modal? Did Dave have something to do with this? It's all Dave. And the, but that's David Bradley, I think is his name. <laughs> that's the guy at IBM that did the control alt delete to reset the computer. So under NT, that still generates a hardware interrupt that the system can distinguish an ID that I absolutely know that the guy pressed control alt delete on the actual physical keyboard. And so at that point, it switches to the SAS or the secu that's the SAS. Secure attention sequence keystroke, which takes you to the SAS desktop, which is a secure desktop, and there's only one of them, and there's none of your other applications are on it. It's just a system desktop, and that's where it presents you with user account control. And so you know when you hit control alt delete that you're on that page. Yeah, GFA Basic 32. Do you have any experience with GFA Basic, Atari, Amiga, DOS, Win? Uh, basic. I learned basic on the TRS-80 Model 1, and then I moved to the C64 and learned basic there. Where else did I, I did use, I had basic for the Amiga, but I can't say that I ever actually wrote anything in basic for the Amiga. I don't think a lot of people did. It was kind of a cool basic language, but it was a weird implementation of it. Am I crazy, or did I hear a space pinball noise in the intro for the first time? Dave said. You may in fact be crazy, but you are hearing a pinball sound in the intro music. My son wrote that little music riff, and so he incorporated some of the sounds from the pinball game because I'd worked and contributed on that when I was on Windows. And uh, yeah, I think it works pretty well. Good catch. And then John Burgess, what's the story behind the friendly giant clips that sometimes appear at the end of your videos? I think that gets a lot of folks. And for those that know, they know. And for those that don't, they're, they're quite <laughs> curious. So it was a children's show and he lived, he was a giant and he lived in a castle and every day he would lower down the drawbridge and you would go into the castle and he had Rusty the rooster who came in the window and he had a giraffe that was so tall, of course, that he was almost as tall as a giant. And so he actually started, I believe, in, I don't know what it says there, Wisconsin, Minnesota, but then he got a deal with CBC in Canada, which is the national broadcasting network and took the show to Canada. And so Glenn and I grew up with it. And at the end, he does this little montage with the chairs, you know, and it, what he says, whatever I say in there, one chair for somebody to curl up in, another for somebody to rock in, or two to curl up in. Somebody pointed out that now it should have, like, for one to rock in, and then maybe a wheelchair for somebody to roll in. That would be more <laughs> inclusive. But they weren't thinking that far ahead in the 60s. Yeah. Or for a gray-bearded wizard in another 15 or 20 years, yeah. Jerome is the name of the giraffe. Okay, that's right. Rusty the Rooster and Jerome the Giraffe. And I didn't remember that. I looked it up, so I'm cheating. Yeah, I was going to say, too, the chairs are actually made by my grandparents yes. who are now long since deceased with a wooden chair with uh, made from clothespins is from my grandmother. 
and the metal can is from my grand or there's a chair made from metal soup cans that are ornately bent. That one's from my grandfather. Yeah. So yeah, and if you enjoy this, make sure you're subscribed to Dave's Attic. And if you could do me a favor, if you think it's interesting, maybe share it with somebody you think might enjoy it because it's got such little reach right now that if everybody shared it with eight people, that'd be crazy. Thanks to the audience tonight for joining us out here at Shop Talk. In the meantime, but in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Shop Talk. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage. <laughs>